I'm pleased to introduce Beth, Beth Macy to politics and prose. Macy is the author of the acclaimed and best-selling books, True Vine and Factory Man. She has also won more than a dozen national awards for her reporting, including a Neiman Fellowship for Journalism at Harvard. In Dope Sick, Macy presents the first comprehensive account of the opioid crisis in America. Today, there are some 2.6 million people addicted to opiates nationwide, and overdoses are the leading cause of death for those under the age of 50. Macy dives into the stories behind these statistics, from the unemployed in distressed communities who use painkillers to numb the pain of joblessness, to the privileged teens who trade pills in cul-de-sacs. Although opioid drug abuse may seem like the only thing that unites Americans across geographic and class lines, Macy does find another common denominator, the spirit and tenacity in those facing addiction to build a better future. Elizabeth Catt, author of What You Are Getting Wrong About Appalachia, writes, Dope Sick is both a tribute to those who lost and a fierce rebuke to those who took, and the new guidebook for understanding this quintessentially American crisis. Macy will be in conversation tonight with Dan Vergano, science reporter at BuzzFeed News. Now, please join me in welcoming Beth Macy and Dan Vergano. Wow, this is an awesome crowd. Thank you so much. This is my first event. I've done some media things in New York this week, but this is my first kind of book event since the book came out on Tuesday, two days ago. And um, I thought I'd just read a very brief section. And I wanted to introduce, Dan was a Neiman Fellow the year before I was a Neiman Fellow, or maybe two years. His wife, Andrea, kind of helped me midwife this book. I would call her and I would go, Andrea, this is, I can't, this, I, this is too hard. And because it was, you all know, this is a really hard subject. I didn't know exactly how I was going to tell the story. I had some stories that I, I always tell students when I teach, follow the stories that move you, the stories that make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. I had those stories, but I wasn't sure how to structure the book. And when I finally figured that out with lots of help from his wife, Andrea, she said, it helps when you tell the reader how to read your book. So we're going to talk about a little bit about craft, um, and a lot about the opioid epidemic, but I want to read the part that his wife made me write because it's actually a pretty good introduction to how the book is. Sorry, set up. you got me instead of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> the book begins with me going to interview a twice convicted drug dealer in prison. And as I'm driving to West Virginia to interview him, um, I'm contemplating kind of what set me there. And I've actually been asked by a mother of a 19 year old. Uh, who overdosed, um, I can't, I want you to help me find out why my son Jesse is dead. I don't understand how he ended up dead on someone else's bathroom floor. So that's the question that I set out to answer through the whole book and also on this trip. And so I write, as I'm, this is sort of while I'm driving, if I could retrace the epidemic as it shape shifted across the spine of the Appalachians, roughly paralleling Interstate 81 as it fanned out from the coal fields of Virginia and crept north up the Shenandoah Valley, I could understand how prescription pill and heroin abuse was allowed to fester, moving quietly and stealthily across this country, cloaked in stigma and shame. Set in three culturally distinct communities that represent the evolution of the epidemic as I reported it, Dope Sick begins in the coal fields in the hamlet of St. Charles, Virginia, in the remote westernmost corner of the state, largely with the introduction of the painkiller OxyContin in 1996. From there, the scourge not only advanced into new territories, but also arrived via a different delivery system as the morphine molecule shifted from OxyContin and other painkillers like Vicodin and Percocet to heroin, the pill's illicit twin, and later, even stronger synthetic analogs. As the epidemic gained strength, it sent out new geographic shoots, moving from predominantly rural areas to urban and suburban settings, though the pattern was never stable or fixed. Heroin landed in the suburbs and cookie-cutter subdivisions near my home in Roanoke in the mid 2000s but it wasn't widely acknowledged until a prominent jeweler and civic leader, Ginger Mumpower, drove her addicted son to, to the federal prison where he would spend the next five years for his role in a former classmate's overdose death. I covered Spencer's transition from private school student to federal inmate at the same time I witnessed the rise in overdose deaths spread north along I-81 from Roanoke. 
It infected pristine farm pastures in small northern Shenandoah Valley towns as more users and increasingly vigilant medical and criminal justice systems propelled the addicted onto the urban corridor from New Baltimore to New York. If you live in a city, maybe you've seen the public restroom with a sharps container or witnessed a librarian administer, administer Narcan. While more and more Americans die of drug overdose, it is impossible to not look back at the early days of what we now recognize as an epidemic and wonder what might have been done to slow or stop it. Christy Fernandez's question, she's the mom that asked me to go to the prison, are not her questions alone. Until we understand how we reach this place, America will remain a country where getting addicted is far easier than securing treatment. So um, that's, that's my tell the reader how to read my book. Um, and um, Dan, we're just, so, gonna, we're just gonna talk. He covers the opioid uh, crisis for BuzzFeed. So yeah, I, I write a lot of these stories about uh, a CDC report or a new study says, or Blue Cross Blue Shield says this thing. Uh, but Beth is the real deal. Uh, she's trying to find people's stories that tell the bigger picture of this epidemic. Um, so uh, thanks for letting me do this. Uh, the, the first question I wonder if you could talk about is uh, how did you start uh, down this road? How did you start writing about the epidemic? Sure. So um, I was the family's beat reporter in Roanoke, Virginia for the Roanoke Times for 25 years. I quit in 2014. One of the last major projects I did was a three-part series in hero about heroin that ran in 2012. And what I did is I followed two families whose lives were upended by heroin. One was a young man who overdosed, and the other was the man, Spencer, that I just mentioned, that um, I followed as he was getting ready to go to prison. I spent the summer with him. He was giving prevention talks. He was, he was getting physically in shape, doing martial arts and things like that. And he schooled me on his culture about how he started with ADHD medication, passing it around he told me about the first time his you know his mother the first time he did cocaine was his mother dropped him off at Tanglewood Mall movie theater and he went in and then went out the back and they were doing drugs by the train tracks I mean just kind of all these things about how he did it and um, I wrote this three-part series about Spencer and about Scott Roth and about their mothers and about how we got to this place and people literally like spit their coffee out and went, what? Wealthy white kids are doing heroin? They had no idea. And of course, they didn't start with heroin. They started with the pills. And after the series ran, um, then I wrote this book, Factory Man, which was my first book. And um, at the end of the reporting for that, I traced the aftermath of globalization in a lot of um, the industrialized factory towns where the furniture factories had closed. And at the end of that, I was hearing that all of the crime was related to heroin and meth in these little dying factory towns. And I wrote about one guy who had burned down an abandoned furniture plant to rip out the, accidentally, he was ripping out the copper wire from the plant to resell in the market, black market. And I thought he was um, doing that because he was desperate. Of course he was desperate. And somebody said later, no, he was, he was trying not to be dope sick. And, and I had this aha moment as I was working on this book when I looked at the jailhouse mugshots and I realized even though they were from totally different backgrounds, they looked exactly the same down to the methamphetamine scratches on their face. So that was a story I, had, I just tracked. I keep up with people that I write about. I spend a lot of time with them. And I mean, I have hundreds of texts from those two mothers. So, so a lot of people uh, have made this connection, the diseases of despair argument you know between economic uh, disaster and the epidemic I, how much of it do you buy how much of it is the the opioid molecule and how much of it is uh, despair that's a great question it's both let's go back to oxycontin in 1996 I, I I write about Lee County Virginia which is the westernmost county in Virginia it's in central Appalachia if you go north you're west of Detroit that's how far west it is and I write about farmers in their 70s getting hooked on Oxycontin, coal miners getting hooked on it, people who had used immediate release opioids like Percodin, uh, per Percocet and Vicodin and Lortab 
uh, for injuries on and off over the years, but had never gotten addicted until OxyContin came out. And their doctors prescribed it for them, it was much powerful than anything that had come before it. And it was said to be only addictive in less than 1% of cases. I mean, it was supposed to be that addiction was, quote, exquisitely rare. And so these reps were sent out to these rural, distressed rural communities where the jobs happened to be going away around the same time. And the reps targeted doctors that were already prescribing a lot of timed release, uh, a lot of these other milder opioids, because they knew that was the low hanging fruit. If they could get them to prescribe OxyContin, then they would make higher bonuses. Literally, they got higher bonuses the more milligrams they convinced uh, a doctor to prescribe. And so that really seeded it. It was like in a town like St. Charles, Virginia, which is where Dr. Van Zee practices, it was like a nuclear bomb going off. And Purdue was sending doctors to, 5,000 doctors, nurses, and pharmacists to uh, training seminars to go out and preach the wonders of um, OxyContin. And they would wear an OxyContin branded beach hat while high schoolers in that high school were overdosing in the library. It was unconscionable, and nobody listened to the people who were trying to warn the others because they were from places like St. Charles, which look worse than Haiti. I mean, when I went, I just couldn't, I had never seen poverty like that and had a no idea that it was so close to my home, four hours away. I mean, it was, it's, if you haven't traveled to rural America, it's changed quite a bit. So uh, you must not have known all this when you started writing about uh, this. When did you say to yourself, oh my God, I got to write a book about this? When? Well, I had finished my last book, True Vine, or yeah, about you know almost 10 months before it came out, and I started casting about for ideas. And I had actually proposed this after Factory Man to my editor and to my agent in New York. And, and they both, they were like, that was 2013, early 2013, and they said heroin. That's a that's a thing, and uh, my agent, who is so New York, um, he goes, "Oh, I think Roanoke's just late getting it. We had it here a while ago." <laughs> I kid you not. And my editor didn't see it either. I have a, I have a different editor now, but um, I mean, both great guys. And um, but this, when I pitched it again to my agent, he said, "Yeah," because it was all over the news, and in fact, you know. Fentanyl was about to arrive, and, and all kinds of news hooks. And so, can you can you talk about some of the things that changed for you as you reported? You know, this uh, it's you write a little bit about it being off in the coal fields, and yeah. then you realize no, it's, it's it's everywhere, right here. Yeah, it's everywhere. And then more recently, I I told you I try to follow the stories that move me. I went back to the people that I had written about in 2012, including the prosecutors that sent. Spencer to prison, and um, former roommate in the front row didn't know. And, um, and I went back and I said, what's going on now? And they all said, well, it's worse than it ever is. And, um, and I said, well, give me an example. And so Don Waltus, the assistant US attorney, pulls out this big chart of 84 uh, user dealers, well, dealers in this ring he had just put away. And he, they can't talk to me about ongoing cases. But um, he could talk to me about this case because they just sent 84 people to prison on, on federal and state charges. And at the top, it said FUBI. And there was one person's name at the top. And he was the ringleader. It was the largest ring in Virginia at the time. And at the bottom, some of the names were crossed out, people who had overdosed. And this is a small little farm town, not a distressed community. It's actually Woodstock, Virginia, which is not that far from here. And I was like, Woodstock has a heroin problem? So he starts telling me about how this town ostensibly went from having a handful of heroin users to hundreds almost overnight. And I said, yeah, but what's F-U-B-I? And he didn't want to tell me. And I, so we talked some more, and I came back. I was like, Don, you have to tell me what F-U-B-I is. And so can I say a bad word here? Yeah. Oh, okay. And he wasn't going to tell me. And I go, fuck you bitches? And he goes, no. So he told me the story about the way they got the people to squeal on the people above them. And it just shows you how fraught the system is with confidential informants. So basically, they had a guy on a state charge. They had him in jail. And they wanted to get to the top guy. 
and they said, look, we've got all this information on you, and if you don't tell us, we're going to come back later with even more charges. We're going to bring more charges back. And the guy goes, F you, bring it. And so that's how the case got its name. And literally, the hair went up on the back of my neck, and I said, I've got to write about this case, because it was just the way those agents were going after this case. And it was such a sprawling case. And I, I got to ask, I, I've interviewed Beth about uh, drug kingpins, the drug dealers. There's this call for punishment uh, for executing drug kingpins. Uh, and who are these people? You know, I, so she looked at this thing. Who, who, who are these dealers who we're now talking about executing? Well, the FUBI guy, the guy who said that, he was a tree trimmer. He had been a heroin user from Baltimore for 25 years. He went to work, hardly ever missed a day. And he was getting ready to go back to jail for uh, state charges. Um, and he went back to dealing in order to save up some money for his jail accounts and also to pay some of his su child support charges. He wasn't Don Corleone. Right? <laughs> he wasn't. So the drug dealers, I mean, to talk about let's execute drug dealers, they're high school cheerleaders, they're football players, they're tree trimmers, they're waitresses. They're people like Tess, who was the young woman that I spent the most time with following in the book. So you, you've met all these people, you've heard all these stories. How do you pick out which ones to tell in this book? Which what is your thinking about who to grab? Because there must be some you know about and you didn't use. Well, I just cast my net really wide, and I interviewed as many people as I could. I knew I wanted to write about that case in Rona because I had notes from it for a number of years, and I had relationships with these people. I had the Coalfield story. I knew I wanted to write about Dr. Van Zee, who was the first physician in the country to call Purdue Pharma on the phone and say, look, I know you say it's not addictive, but we've got kids ODing in the high school library. He said, my, he wrote them a letter in 2000, my fear is that these distressed rural areas are sentinel areas just like New York and San Francisco were in, in the first years of HIV. And of course he was right. So I knew I wanted to write about those two stories. And then I had the FUBI story. And then I just traced that. I asked one of the cops that put that case together if he knew any parents that I could interview. And that's how I found Christy Fernandez who wanted to meet me at her son's grave overlooking the high school football field. The cemetery's right next to the football field in this little town. And it's got his football number, 55, on his gravestone in a photo of him. And she says to me, she likes me when I arrive because the number on my license plate contains the number 55. She said, that's a sign from Jesse that it's good. you're a good person to talk to. And you see these parents who have lost children, and they're just looking for any way to connect. And they really want to understand what happened so they can help other people not do it too. And, and so how do you weave their stories together? I mean, you just don't do one story, two story, three story, and have a mm -hmm. book. You know, what was your thinking of like... Well, my thinking was I had these three stories, and I knew how the Oxycontin related to the Roanoke City and Suburbs story. And then I had this other great story, and I went out to lunch with my friend Eli, who's a historian. She goes, I get those two related, but not the third one. And basically, I just figured out, uh, using data from Shannon Monat, um, the rural oh, yeah, sociologist, man. that actually the story of heroin coming to Woodstock, it's just chronological. You know, so first you have it in these distressed communities, then you have it in cities and suburbs, and then around 2012 it starts hitting almost every area, right? So even like the numbers of opioid prescribing in Woodstock were much lower, like like 10 times lower than in Lee County, and and the economic indicators are much better there too. So you know, one of my chapters is titled "Objects in Mirror Are Closer Than They Appear," like it says on your little mirror. And I just wanted people to come away with the fact that, you know, we all need to arm ourselves with information about this. We all need to become better consumers of our health care. And I believe there's a lot of treatment things that we all should be advocating for as well. And so can you, you talk about that? What are the barriers to that better treatment? Uh, we all know about this. this is a very crowded room. Uh, you know, why is it more happening? Such a great question. Um, I get asked that a lot. And um, th there, why isn't it like ACT UP was with HIV, right? And so there's 23 million people in recovery. And um, there's a huge I ideological uh, divide between people who believe in abstinence-only treatment and um, 
people, including scientific authors of studies about the best way to prevent overdose death, which is through medication assisted treatment, such as methadone and buprenorphine. And um, study after study shows that you're 40 to 60 percent, 50 to 60, depends if it's done well, uh, less likely to die of overdose death. And so to, I mean, it's often compared to rob somebody of the ability to access this maintenance medication is like not allowing a diabetic to have insulin. But that's a very, like I've watched, I followed a young woman for two and a half years and I, I drove her to NA meetings and um, I watched her be shamed for being on Suboxone at the time. And uh, she asked somebody to sponsor her, no one would, and that was like daggers to her. Can, can you say something about the Shenandoah Valley, about Roanoke? You know, it's a very close to Washington, but it's also apart yeah. from here, you know. Yeah, so Roanoke is a city of about uh, 300,000 um, in the valley, and it's kind of like, it thinks it's the capital of Western Virginia, and, um, but also thinks it's a little ignored by Richmond, et cetera. Um, and it's become, it used to be a train town and now it's very affiliated with um, Carilion Health System and we have a new medical school there. So we've gone from a train city to a brain city. They're really researching addiction a lot. But a lot of the, like Tess for instance, the young woman I was just talking about, I watched her you know, not be able to access treatment over and over again while these world-class researchers two blocks from where she lived were getting million dollar grants that had seemed to have no application to her her life. And if you go to Carillion right now, you'll have to wait three weeks before you can get in an OBOT program to get on these med maintenance medications. There's no system that feeds people from the ER into treatment. Um, the community service board, uh, he was just quoted in the paper last week of saying, uh, no, we only let you do that, that maintenance medication if you fail counseling first. <laughs> If you fail first, like in an age of fentanyl, when that's out on the streets, and I mean, that's that's against the state policy, by the way. But that's there's there just isn't enough leadership at the state, at the local, at the federal level. Um, Virginia approved syringe exchange. Only one is open, and way out in Wise, Virginia, which is super cool that they have a really great uh, health department director. Our health department director in Roanoke has been silent. The police chief came out against it, said it wasn't good for Roanoke. And I have friends whose kids were walking to school recently and uh, you know, there's discarded needles on their way to school. So, I mean, syringes about more than just getting clean syringes, it's about recovering used syringes and um, making connections with people, especially people who are living homeless and um, maybe don't want to come in and ask for help yet, but if they go there to get syringes, maybe they can make a relationship and they can eventually be uh, referred for treatment. I mean, that's the goal. I visited a place where that works really well in Boston. Uh, so one of the, we'll, we'll let them talk. Okay. Uh, one of the last thing maybe I ask before we ask them for questions is, there is a lot of talk about removing uh, stigma from addiction, from opioid use disorders. Uh, is that something you hope your book achieves, you know, to show that these are these are just people and they're in trouble? Yeah, yeah. One of the first people I interviewed was a woman in the coal fields who who got addicted after gallbladder surgery. And, and she says, she says, my husband and I understood that I was supposed to wake up in the middle of the night to take a Percocet for breakthrough pain in between the Oxycontin. And she said, I thought he was a higher standard person than I was. And then when she started becoming dope sick, which is withdrawal, her neighbor said, hey, you know, if you snort them, they hit you better. And then another neighbor realized had been laid off from her job, had worked in a factory for years and years. And so now the woman who's still with dope sick talks her older neighbor, Marge, who's just lost her job, into going to the doctor and presenting with symptoms that she didn't really have so that Marge can then sell her half of her pills. And so it became a currency in these distressed communities, especially if you had a Medicaid card, it would only cost you a dollar or two. You can make thousands of dollars selling your Oxycontin bills. But I think about that. She said, she said, at the end of your journey, you're not doing it to get high. You're just doing it to not be dope sick. She said, and you're so miserable. I love the way people out there talk. She said, you're as mad as an angry hornet will ever be. 
And um, but back to your question about stigma, I, I, want, I want people to understand that concept of dope sickness. And I want them to, um, I've seen so many families lose loved ones and they don't, and, and the loved ones that they've lost who've been suffering with this have made their lives hell. And, they're, and they've gotten in fights and they've stolen grandma's jewelry and they've stolen from them and they've, they've it's just creating havoc in families. And, and yet you still see people sitting in the pews of the funeral, not really seeing the person as someone who was worthy of medical attention until they're at the funeral. And I would just love it if um, this book inspired people to understand that and um, to advocate for, for, for um, leadership on this issue. Be okay if anybody, if folks want to ask you a question, if you, yeah, they want you to go to the mic. Yeah, is there anything that this country can learn from other countries such as Western countries that where this might have started to occur or from third world countries that produce opiates where it might be an endemic rather than an epidemic problem? Right. Um, well, Portugal has de decriminalized drugs a number of years ago. And do, do you want to take that part? You've d have you reported on that? A little bit. Uh, obviously, the Western European example is a good one. Uh, they've been through a lot of this stuff already, and they've done report after report saying you need needle exchange, you need medication-assisted treatment, you need to give people a, a screening when they overdose for for uh, you know mental illness you know not just opioid use disorder we just don't have a system the way that they do uh, uh on, on on asia i don't know i end up covering more of the state department trying to stop fentanyl being shipped here than anything else that would be great if that would happen the one thing we didn't talk about so much is like how much the fentanyl infiltrating the heroin supply has led to overdose deaths it's, it's unbelievable and things like car fentanyl it's like a bomb going off in a town when one of that it would be great if we could stop that. Uh, best my head. Hi. Um, it's my understanding that according to the latest CDC figures, about 30,000 Americans died of a synthetic opioid overdose in 2017. And it might be that only 30,000 died because of the availability of Narcan, and otherwise known as Naloxone, nationwide. And it, do you know if the same companies are producing the opioids and the opioid antidote? And uh, just one other thing, the president declared an opioid emergency about a year ago, last October. Did you see any action at the federal level um, that has continued to today to address that problem? So uh, the short answer is no. Adapt Pharma makes Narcan. They don't make, uh, they're not Purdue Pharma. So they're different uh, actors. Uh, there's their own problem. There's concern about the price of naloxone going up, especially for the auto injector, things like that. People have raised that issue. Uh, um, On the issue of Trump and the, the oh, yeah. so-called national emergency so, that he was going to uh, declare? They, they have, I mean, in fairness, there, there were some good things done. There was the, they lifted the limit on Medicaid uh, reimbursement for large uh, bed facilities, which they had taken off, you know, the books before. I think that was like an, uh, a Reagan era rule. So you could have more people in a uh, psychiatric facility getting treatment and getting being able to pay for it with Medicaid. That's a good thing. Uh, on balance, however, you know, the Christie Commission made 54 recommendations, right? And the administration hasn't taken up very many of those. Um, they yeah. will defend the response. You know, the Congress has put more money towards it. Um, the last I heard, only 25% of the Cures Act money even has, has filtered down to communities. It right. And if you put it in up against like the, the, the height of the AIDS crisis, you know, the money that flowed in at that point where that sad just killed a lot of people, but actually fewer than now are dying of, of opioids. Then no. I mean, I actually asked uh, Hal Rogers, the congressman who was uh, the head appropriator and started putting in motion a lot of this stuff, like, why haven't you done more? And he got very angry. We've done a lot. We've done the Cures Act. We've done all these other things. You know, don't push me. You know, Washington works uh, slow. You know, to get this money out, it's lucky we can do anything. Um, but Jesus, you know, it's a lot of people <laughs> are dying, and so um, it seems like more needs to be done. I, you know, one of the things people have pointed to, and Beth mentioned, is there's like not the social movement that there was uh, at the height of the AIDS crisis. There's, you know, and 
it's because I, I don't I don't know why. You know, it's a lot of people dying. Is but, part of it the ideological divide over MAT? So you're not able to galvanize that 23 million in recovery if half of them don't believe in it? I, I, you need a you need a sociologist. Maybe yeah. uh, you know the I was in you know here in D.C. in the early 90s when at the height of the AIDS crisis and it was young people dying and their friends were pissed off and they were dying doing die-ins on the steps of Congress and yeah. but these are chronic pain patients and families who've lost their kids you know maybe they're not going to drive in from. Uh, they're worn out. West Virginia, yeah, you they're know, really they, worn out, and and do that. Or so there's always more that can be done. Just just not enough right now. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Purdue has an ad for today's post in which they're congratulating themselves. It sounds like for imposing a, a weekly limit on uh, prescriptions, mm -hmm. and they also congratulate themselves in actually appointing a doctor as their chief executive. Uh, do you think the pharmacists have done a fairly good job in trying to get on top of this? I know the CVS chief executive uh, issued the order that there are only going to be 60 pills per week to anybody. Hmm. 60. 60 a week. Are you familiar with that? I asked Michael about a week. Uh, <laughs> uh, it seems like a lot for a week. Uh, maybe it's a month. Yeah, maybe it's a refill. Um, again, uh, they had the. The pharmacies are different than the pharmaceutical company like Purdue. Uh, uh, pharmacy companies have taken steps to limit uh, CVS and Walgreens to limit prescriptions. Uh, they are more willing to take back drugs than they used to be. You know, they've set up kiosks for that. They are doing more. Uh, whether they did enough uh, back then, it's weird to talk to somebody who's left. Uh, the uh, 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 is. Is, uh, <laughs> oh. is, uh, is a matter of contention. Um, yeah. Well, they paid a six hundred thirty-four million dollar fine when Purdue did when they were um, uh, pled guilty to criminally misbranding the drug, but none of that money went to treatment. And a lot of people believe, you know, there's this case in Cleveland that uh, uh, federal judge Dan Polster is overseeing five hundred plus cities, counties, towns, etc. People are hopeful that um, that some treatment funding from the pharmaceutical companies will come. But um, we're at the tobacco litigation stage with the with the pharmaceutical companies behind this. So see how that turns out. Whether that comes. Hi, um, I was a little excited about your book, so I pre-ordered it and oh, have you. read it already I mean, since it was, came out on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one thing I had two thoughts. One is I wondered if you came to any um, conclusion about um, what is a what is you know what is a possible solution. For example, I I'm a social worker mm -hmm. and I had really major open heart surgery two years ago where they actually removed part of my heart and oh, yeah. I actively resisted pain control because I was very fearful of being addicted. And I, they did give me fentanyl, but I only accepted it for about three days and then I said they just wanted to tough it out. So I wasn't sure, like if you came to any idea of like, so you, you know, you've and that is what fentanyl was intended for, was for yeah, late yeah. stage cancer patients and major surgery. Yeah. And my doctor did give me Oxycontin and I refused to take it because I was so scared of being addicted, although I, mm -hmm. the pain was pretty bad. Yeah. And so I just really haven't come up with any solutions for the people I work with who are addicts. I mean, other than counseling and helping them get resources because it just seems like it was so, it's like so hard and then when I when I fell and I broke my elbow the doctor was like here's 60 oxycontin yeah, yeah. and I went to the emergency room and I say I, I think I need the pain medication for about three days yeah. and I tried to give the medicine back to Walgreens and they wouldn't take it and I tried to give it into the police department and they wouldn't take wow. it and I tried to give it um, there was like one other place you could take it and they wouldn't take it. So I was walking around with these 57 Oxycontin that I didn't need that I was trying to turn in right. and everybody was like, oh, just keep them. So that's like one of the ways the crisis started because then somebody's teenager pulls us out of the, the thing and sells them to their friends. And so this is like the root of the, 
one of the roots of the problem. And what you're also alluding to is that we just have, we don't treat pain very well in this country <laughs> and we don't have mm -hmm. great solutions for pain. And the um, whole, every ill can be cured with a pill, you know? The way we think about things is, you, yeah. know, you go to the doctor's office for 15 minutes and get a prescription instead of, you know, learning cognitive therapy that really takes a lot of work to, you know, get it to work for you if you're pain. So this is the heart of the problem. If it was easy, we would have fixed it. <laughs> uh, uh, all the things we're talking about are all the things people are doing. One of the things we were talking about before this is there's all these people who are, uh, with, suffer from chronic pain and usually something else as well who are now physically dependent on sometimes high doses of these things. What do we do for those folks who are trying to cut down prescriptions? Those people are suffering and unhappy. So it's a, it's a big, wicked problem everything wrong with our country opioids makes it worse like mm -hmm. payday loans are bad throw in opioids that'll make it worse you know uh, unemployment is bad throw in opioids it makes it worse you know it is like an x-ray uh, for right. and it takes advantage for, of for the gaps opioids. in our system the way criminal justice mm -hmm. and healthcare so often working at odds it like gets in there and it it festers this sounds facile but what I tell my patients is the only way out is through mm. like there's no easy solution. And, um, I only had one other question, which was, I read Barry Meyer's book, Painkiller. Mm -hmm. I tend to read all the books that came out. And in the book, you mentioned that did somehow Purdue Pharma get him off his opioid reporting B? That was actually in my book. Uh, in your, in your yeah. book, yes. I, but I, I just recognized I interviewed his Barry. name. Yeah, he wrote this really seminal book in 2003 about Purdue Pharma and the FDA mm -hmm. um, lack of oversight, and it, it's it's a real page turner. And um, believe it or not, it, it is. And I learned a lot. And then, but Purdue uh, at the time, New York Times had just um, created a position of ombudsman. And after his book came out, their chief legal counsel went to the New York Times ombudsman and said, Barry Meyer now has a has a financial interest in uh, selling his book so you can't let him write about opioids anymore and uh, with a few exceptions he didn't until the 2007 sentencing hearing and the guilty plea and the guilty plea happened to be in May of 2007 it was his 58th birthday and you can read in the book about how excited he was to see those executives slink into the federal courthouse and have to plead guilty he was really he felt like everything he had reported had been justified and he said he's you he said that he thought his opioid he was done associating his name with it but that it was actually just beginning yeah he he, <laughs> he told me i don't know how you're going to be able to do that he he said it's not the pencil factory or the circus yeah. uh, <laughs> one of one of the things if you're little. reading the book hmm. is that and apologies to anybody who works for pharma but these are pretty tough companies you know the a lot of the tactics that the Purdue used to increase prescriptions are standard ones for the industry to, you know, the detailing and the going to doctors and identify the ones who are the high prescribers and being nice to them. That was pretty much standard m marketing uh, in the industry. So it, it's yeah, they weren't they were not the only ones doing it. Yeah, they would find out what a doctor wanted, and they would show up with that item, whether it was Cuban cigars or. Christmas trees or standing rib roasts. One doctor put up a sign-up sheet in her lobby. Her daughter's 13th birthday was coming up, and she wanted to know if a rep wanted to sponsor her daughter and her friends to go to Carowinds. I mean, that was really, that doesn't happen anymore, thank goodness, but they still get free meals, and they have to report it all. You know, since 2010, it's all have to be reported, but um, it's a tough business. Hi. Uh, so what, one of the things the companies have done is uh, develop abuse deterrent versions of these drugs. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the value of that and addressing this issue or, you know, or the of course, lack of value? Of course, OxyContin was um, one of the first things Art Van Z wanted them to do. He begged them to take it off the market when he saw all these ODs and all this crime skyrocketing in his community. And he said, please take it off until you can reformulate it to be abuse deterrent, which a company called Taiwan, Taiwan had done years earlier when they realized more, their morphine derivative product was being uh, misused and diverted widely. And so there was an example, and um, they didn't do it until 14 years later in 2010. And um, cynics think only because their patent was about to expire. 
but you might be alluding to, there's like a lot of concern that that's helped drive the heroin crisis, that it became harder for people who are now physically dependent on these pills to get not be dope sick. And so they turn to heroin and you, you can make that argument. You can see the, the overdoses from heroin increasing in the early yeah, part of this certainly. decade. And then the market's oversaturated and so they start replacing the heroin with illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent than, than is it morphine or heroin? It's, it's very potent stuff. And uh, so then those, you start overtaking, those deaths start overtaking heroin deaths. Sometime in the middle of 2016, there's more fentanyl deaths than there are heroin deaths. And it's just gone, kept on going that way. And now fentanyl is into the cocaine supply. Uh, and so you start seeing more cocaine deaths, but really they're fentanyl deaths. So it's a, again, it's a wicked problem. They take one step and something else happens. There's this iron law of prohibition. You know, as soon as you outlaw uh, one form of a drug, then a more potent form of it that's easier to get through the system, like, will show up. And that is exactly what happened in the United States in the early 70s with its first heroin crisis. And it's what's happened now going from Oxycontin to heroin to fentanyl. And even in, you know, like I said, you see carfentanyl, which is ungodly potent, you know, showing up as a way to stretch out the heroin supply, I think. Either that or they're just insane and, you know, don't care what they're giving people. Thank you. We're a lot of fun at the dinner table when we talk. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Um, so my dad's an ER doc at a local hospital, and, and he told me that, um, in his hospital at least, uh, because of morphine shortages, they're using fentanyl for most, if not. Uh, do you know anything about that? So Yeah, fentanyl is, illicit fentanyl is, is a great uh, way to treat acute pain. It's very common in emergency rooms. That's not really a problem. The fentanyl that's killing people is illicitly manufactured fentanyl yeah the ingredients come from yeah from china mostly and and they're manufactured by not great chemists it's not heisenberg from right. you know uh uh breaking bad thank you uh, it's, uh <laughs> so the so yeah there are overdoses from fentanyl patches that are diverted every year but i think that that's like 3000 people a year which is terrible but it's not uh 30000 people uh so that's where most of the fentanyl deaths are coming so it's 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 a Prescribed prescription fentanyl is a perfectly legitimate drug, so it, I, it's, that doesn't seem to be with the, the root of that problem. Hi, sorry, Beth, if I missed if you've already said this, but um, on a personal level, um, writing this book, um, who made the biggest? Did you already say this? Who made the biggest impact on you in this book? Can you can you pick one person? Um, you mean of the people I wrote about? Yes. Um, well, that would be or not. I mean, that would probably be Tess Henry. So she's the young woman that I met um, in late 2015. She was a young mother. She was on the cusp of losing custody of her child after she relapsed and lost her um, buprenorphine uh, access. And then she became homeless. And, um, you know, I, t I tell her story. I followed her story for two and a half years. And I really got close to her mother, who felt so alone. She's a hospital nurse. She sent her daughter to abstinence only rehab center in Nevada and um, she checked herself out when it didn't work out and was living on the streets prostituting and being involved in trafficking and criminal gangs and um, ends up you know she the mother ends up just going to sleep every night praying and hoping that Tess will call and things will be okay and Tess was not okay and um, so you, it was just an example of how alone parents feel. I mean, I've, there were days where I was practically the only one that was giving her advice, and she was trying to get, he was trying desperately to get her daughter home, and but she didn't have an ID because she was living homeless, and she got her. She I don't know how she did it. She got her an ID at the Virginia DMV, but then she didn't have a place to mail it to because she was living homeless. So we're brainstorming, trying to line up treatment for when she gets back. And at one point I said, uh, and she also doesn't believe in Suboxone, or didn't at the time because she had seen Tess misuse it and she had had many patients 
get abscesses and from injecting it, et cetera. And I said, but at least it has no fentanyl in it. So there were these moments in the reporting where journalistic lines got blurred and I just felt like, even though I'm not supposed to change the outcome of a story, it would just be wrong to be quiet and not say anything at all. And at one point I said, well, she's doing a heroin every day now. If your concern is she can't ride a bus back for three days to Virginia because she's gonna get dope sick, she could just take a little bit of heroin each day, right? That would stop her from getting dope sick. And it's like, we st we still in this country can't talk about that basic fact of, of the withdrawal and how they can't handle it. I was just gonna say, it is worth saying it's different from everybody. You do interview people who withdrawal isn't that bad. I'm sorry to, you're, I know you guys, no, and uh, there are happy stories, you know, that we do run into people who do recover, yes. and, and it is yes. what we're saying, you know. That was yeah. my question. There's a, oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. No, I think this is really wonderful you wrote this book and it, to shine a light on this important issue, and there are over 20 million people in this country in recovery, as you yeah. mentioned, and I haven't, I did not pre-order, I did not read the book yet. So are there stories of recovery in your book? There are stories. There are even stories of people in the coal fields getting off disability because they've been in really good treatment and in really good counseling. And and guess what? They some of them didn't want to give me their names because they were afraid people would would um, you know discriminate against them because they're on these maintenance medications. And so um, you know that's, that's wonderful, but also kind of heartbreaking that they still can't come out of the closet about it because of things like that happened to Tess when nobody wanted to sponsor her. And um, and there are other I mean Spencer got out of prison recently, and um, he's doing pretty good. He's traumatized. He had to get a. He has PTSD and he has a service dog, but he's still work. He wants his goal is he wants to have a gym, a jujitsu gym, and um, he he sends me videos of his his fights. I don't really get it, but he's <laughs> he's doing good. It's really important. There's there is hope. You know, it is, it, sometimes hope. we we're like cops. We only see the really bad things that happen. So there there yeah. are a lot of people who yeah. who succeed and you know do recover and you meet really brave people who are helping other people a lot of times you know That's you talk right. to the counselor and they're like you think this guy's bad what well, you should have seen me three years ago my, my friend george is a um a, a presbyterian minister and uh we, we were having a little pastoral counseling not too long ago and he goes beth not everyone is a heroin addict <laughs> like, you're right it's good uh, I also finished the book yesterday, and wow. I thought it was fantastic. And I want to say, thank you. Uh, as you listen tonight, it sounds hopeless, and it seems kind of negative. And you tell the stories of Dr. Tansy, the health wagon, Sister Bess. I mean, there's a lot of really great stories. Yeah. And that's, I thought, yeah. the takeaway from yeah. me. Oh, great. And also, um, people like in Gray, Tennessee. Do you remember at the end? There's this community in Gray, Tennessee, which is just near Johnson City. And nobody wants uh, this nonprofit, really well-run methadone clinic to open in this little rural town. And so the community organizes against ETSU, which is sort of doing the efforts to bring it there. And you see this happens all over the country with things like this. They, they, they want to do it by the best practices. The community doesn't want it while privately they're going, my son struggles with this too. And what I learned is you just have to have an advocate being fierce and showing up. And as one person said, getting your ass kicked over and over in all these community meetings that you have to go to 50 times. And at one point, one of the leaders of this effort to open this methadone clinic was a doctor who himself had been addicted to Oxycontin in recovery. He was trying to convince them. He said, Beth, I looked out and I could see people I went played ball with in his hometown. I could see four church st steeples. And somebody said, how many chances do we give these people? And he said, seven times 70, which is what Jesus said. And it was like, yeah, seven times 70. Thank you. Y'all were great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Oh my God, it's like having a, a mental Rolodex on call. Thanks for putting up with me.